How's it going, YouTube? My name's Elvin Ninja Seven, your resident Mistweaver Monk, and we are back for another episode of this little mini series that I'm doing where I talk about some of the dungeons this tier and talk through some of the tech or tips and tricks that Mistweavers have to deal with these mechanics. Now, a lot of these are just generally press this button in this situation because it works better than in this situation, but there are some neat tips and tricks that we have in our kit and some utility that we have that makes some of these mechanics kind of cheesable. You guys really liked the first episode of this and really wanted me to make more and make more on all of the dungeons. Today we plan on talking about the two Dawn of the Infinite dungeons and then Everbloom and then we can make a third wrap up series kind of covering any that we missed, but then also going back with Blackbrook and Waycrest. Let's go and kick things off with Galakrond's Fall. And the first cool tech that you can do is actually on Kronikar, which already is a pretty easy boss, but there could be scenarios in which some of your allies die on this fight. And a lot of them have to do with this sand mechanic. Now, not a lot of people really know how this work, but this sand reduces your movement speed by 15%, but also your haste. So if you are losing people to that sand debuff or they're just taking one too many ticks and you as the healer are not able to react in time, it's because of the haste reduction that it's applying. It can reduce, look, look at my haste by the way. It is normally, my haste is 31%. It goes down to 5%. So it's huge, a huge haste reduction. So in order to counteract this as a Mistweaver, we can actually use Chigi. Now, I know this sounds weird. Obviously, just press Chigi on this fight because Chigi's good. But when these sand pits are dropped, especially in higher keys, you want to have all of the reaction time that you can at your disposal. So when I press Chigi, watch my haste number. So when I step on it, I go to five. But when I summon Chigi, she makes me, or he, I don't know, Chigi makes me immune to the speed reduction, thus making me immune to the entire debuff, basically not negating that haste. So haste is 31 and remains 31 while Chigi is out because I am immune to this withering sample or this mechanic. Now the other cool trick that you can do on this fight as a Mistweaver is when he leaps on you. If you get selected for the leap mechanic, you know that you have to move out of the circle and then get back in for the little small circle soak. So what we can do is we can actually transcendence whenever we get selected and then after being selected, you can move out of the circle. And then just simply once that circle goes off, you can transcend its back. And then you're closer to that soak point, that small ring. I don't know why Kronikar is not casting that spell right now. I tried to bait him into doing it, but he's just not casting it. For the time waste boss, you're kind of lucky that you're in melee because instead of running out all around out here, you can ride the wave to your right. So find whatever orbs are on your right and just walk underneath them and it makes that so much easier. Also for this debuff, I see a lot of people whenever I do coaching that they look, they have some indicator on their bars of which zone people are in and who has the debuff. But I found that the best way to deal with this debuff is to look actually for the characters that are in there because you could see someone who is standing still but in a situation like this, where they tick into the next zone. And if you just use your um, like plate profiles to dispel them or to indicate who to dispel, it could be wrong. But if you see someone standing like this, like see their character, like the ox statue out there in the zone, then you can look who it is. You could, you have enough time to read the name, find that on, on the name plates. Or what I like to do sometimes is I literally click on the person and dispel that way. And it works just the same there. I just detox the black ox statue. Yes, it's not the most time efficient thing. You're not getting the quickest dispel off, but you as a Mistweaver Monk have so much time to do that. You can dispel the first person, so dispel the Ox Statue, and then you have enough time for a Shailun's Gift cast, and then to get the other dispel to just fall off naturally. And I think that is the best way and can save you from a lot of mistakes with this mechanic. Next up is this double Risen Dragon Pool. I'm sure that you guys have lost some teammates or maybe even yourself to this pool. But the trick to this pool is that it is it is pure AoE. The only single target damage that really comes out in this pool that's threatening is the Swirly, and you can't really do anything to negate that as a healer. But there is a tip here. 
So although it's true that you can just sit there and spinning crane kick and negate a lot of this AoE damage, AoE pulses that's coming in from the dragons and do good AoE healing that way, what I always do is make sure that I have one of the dragons as my main target. I am targeting this dragon. And the reason being is a lot of times it's worth it to weave in a rising sun kick on those dragons because they are priority damage. They are who's gonna die the slowest, so it's good for you to put the most damage in them, and it's just good value. Weaving in your Rising Sun Kicks whenever it's off cooldown is just good value. Now, I would not really take that a step further and go into your whole Tiger Palm Blackout Kick rotation unless you're you're choosing to go with chi uh, on this pool, which is totally fine. This pool does big damage, and on some weeks you have to use chi for the extra Mastery procs, the bonus healing that you're getting. But I would just, if you're planning on just spinning crank kicking, try to target one of the dragons instead of having your targeter just default to one of the orbs and not really thinking about it and just spamming spinning crank kick. Because it could help and it could lead to more healing at the end game. Once it's just these dragons left, you'll have a few renewing mists out that can help out in the pool. The next tip is on the phase three of this boss. Now, this boss is pretty difficult all around. But the only real tech that we have for this fight other than just use cooldowns during big damage is whenever an ally gets targeted by the the root the necro frost you have tigers lust that can really save them you see here we're we're rooted if we tigers lust them that can help them move out of all the mechanics because in this phase of this fight the only real death causing things are things like incinerating incinerating blight Things that are because you're standing in them and the last thing you want as the healer is to have someone's death on your hands and that could happen from Necrofrost frost rooting them and then them getting targeted by a frontal or having a swirly under them or just letting the creeping rot ground seep over them and them dying that way. So make sure and unroot them and then they should be good and they should have no excuse for dying to a mechanic. Next up is Eridicron and as you guys know, one person gets selected for a big slam and they have to soak that with chromie and then right after that there is a big aoe healing phase now as a mistweaver monk we have every tool in the book to deal with this but let me show you one that saves you your cooldowns now obviously in higher keys you will still probably have to commit like shaloons or revival to the aoe pump but how I like to deal with this mechanic is when I see who the target is selected, say that I am the target selected by the single target Chromie Soak, what I like to do is right once they're selected, I like to apply both of my hots to that person. And then after that, as I'm stacking up after they take the big slam and we go and stack up with them, what I like to do as I'm moving to that stack point with them is I'll apply my Renewing Mists to two of the other allies, not that person that I just healed that got selected, two of my other allies. And then you can spread Renewing Mist two ways. So if you're running Tier of Mourning, what I like to do is I like to Thunder Focus T and then Enveloping Mist the other two people. So say I got selected, I would heal myself first. And then as I'm moving into that circle, I would Renewing Mist two of the DPSs, and then I would Thunder Focus T, Enveloping Mist the tank, and then the third DPS. So everyone except myself, everyone except that target, I would put a hot on. So either one of my two Renewing Mist charges or my Thunder Focus T double Enveloping Mist on those targets. Or if you're running Rising Mists, what you can do is you can do the same thing. As you're moving into that circle, apply your two Renewing Mist charges to two DPS, and then Thunder Focus T, your Rising Sun Kick, which will then apply Renewing Mist to those targets through Rapid Diffusion, and then you'll have four Renewing Mists on, on every player, one Renewing Mist on four different players, everyone at least except for that one person. And then once you move into that stack point and you get secure and, and it, Riddicron's about to start that big AOE damage, you can then select that target again, the person that Eridicron originally selected, channel a Soothing Mist, Enveloping Mist, and then spam Vivifies into this target. Those Vivifies will then cleave onto the entire party and save you a healing cooldown. Now let me show you what it looks like in the fight. So you see here, he selected me, so I would put both of my hots on this person. They would then take the slam like a champ, and then as I'm moving in, I would Renewing Mist, Renewing Mist, Thunder Focus T, Enveloping Mist, Enveloping Mist, and then pick that target, start channeling Soothing Mist, 
and, a, and cleave healing on everyone. Obviously here, I only have myself to target, but understand that we're gonna be applying those four hots to your four allies. And then once again, if you are running Rising Mist, you would just, instead of pressing Enveloping Mist twice, you would just press Thunder Focus T. Now also, when targeting Chromie, you treat this the same way as you treat Seedling. If you watched my old Trinket video, or if you've watched my last episode where I talk about single target healing, to heal Chromie, you have just enough time to do it before these earthquakes even start happening if you Renewing Mist her first. So what that looks like is I Renewing Mist and then I channel my Soothing Mist uh, to heal her. So we, we Renewing Mist and then we channel Soothing Mist, Enveloping Mist, Spam Vivifies into her. The reason being is because if you apply Renewing Mist first, you're gonna get the, the Chi Harmony buff on her, increasing her healing by 50%. And then if your next global is Soothing Mist and then Enveloping Mist, then she's gonna have a further 40% healing increase from the then Vivifies that you're gonna be spamming into her. She'll be topped up in no time. She'll take so much healing. You're gonna blast up on these HPS charts. It's gonna look sick. So once again, let me show you as if I had Rising Mist selected. So we would just spot heal this person. And then as we move into the circle, Renewing Mist one person, Renewing Mist the second person, Thunder Focus T, Rising Sun Kick, Rising Sun Kick, and then you pick that OG person, start spamming Vivifies into them. You'll have everyone in the party coated with Renewing Mist. It's gonna be sick, it's gonna do big healing. And the reason why you would do this is once again, to save your cooldowns if you need them during this Earth Surge phase, because it's a lot of healing required on the party. And especially in higher keys, you will also want a cooldown here. But for the most part, in most people's keys, you shouldn't need to use this tip. You should just commit a cooldown during that AOE healing phase because that is the biggest damage everyone's going to be taking uh, for the most part. Moving over to Mirazon's Rise, this pool right here, a lot of times you'll see people pull both of these packs together. Now, a lot of groups struggle with these pools because there are so many casts that are going off at once. So these Infinite T Magus guys, all of these guys are gonna be casting some pretty deadly casts and that is gonna be Corroding Volley. Now your job, yes, it is to stop those casts. However, as the healer or if you're a tank player, whatever you play, healers and tanks are pretty ideal candidates to be the stops or the kicks on Spurlocks. And especially if you're a melee healer like Mistweaver, you're a very ideal candidate to be the person to go into the sand to kick this guy. So ideally, as a Mistweaver, you want to save your single target kick for Spurlock, but use your AoE CC for these Corroding Volleys. You have a ton of CC. You even have Paralysis that can come in clutch and stop some casts if you need it to. So if you do pull this whole pack, and I might die here, but if you pull this whole pack, don't stop the Epoch Bolts. But if you have Corroding Volleys going off, kick those with your AoE stops. And then you can come in here and be the single target kick candidate. The reason why you want to be the person to run in there and kick Spurlock instead of the DPS is because you're just, it, you lose a lot less value if the healer runs in and does it than if the DPS stop their damage rotation, killing this pack even slower um, and going in there and, and stopping it. And if your group is on top of these AoE stops, you should not need much healing in this pack. But you don't want your DPS to stand in here incapacitated. So just run in there, use your single target kick, use your AoE ring of pieces paralysis on these, uh, these corroding volley casts. You should be good to go. For the time lost battlefield, this isn't really a tip for specifically Mistweaver how to use any tech. But being a melee healer, a lot of times you can really mess up this fight and if you're someone who consistently struggles on this fight it could be due to your positioning now since you're in melee you're going to be right up next to the boss but if you are on the inside of the boss meaning relative to this big circular circular platform if you stand on the inside of the boss you are aiming that frontal you could bait the frontal to hit all of those um, NPCs or enemies, but if you stand on the outer ring, the outer side of the boss, you will bait your frontal toward the outside, not toward these enemies. And the reason why that's important is because the boss amps up in damage. Like he will start stacking up huge damage if you hit those uh, those enemies with the frontal. But if you bait all of them to the outside, 
by standing right on the outer edge of the boss, uh, then you should have a lot less times where you're actually hitting those NPCs with the frontal. And yeah, like I said, this fight just amps up like exponentially the more times you let those enemies get hit. I have basically never struggled on Morchi in this dungeon, and it's all due to one tip. But I do want to say for Mirazon's Rise, I should have mentioned this for Tier, but in this dungeon, every single time that I spawn into this place, I put a marker on my tank because every single boss, it maybe, yeah, every single boss has a frontal in this dungeon. A lot of packs might have frontals too, but every boss has a frontal. So it's always good to mark your tank just to play safe. Even if you're someone who thinks it's lame to mark tanks, just do it. But for Morchi, she also has a frontal, so you want your tank marked. But one thing that I do, and it makes it so easy, this fight is so easy, you might not know how much health she has, but simply press V. Turn off your nameplates. Whatever button you have that toggles your nameplates, turn it off. Because when she spawns all of the clones of herself, like I said, I can, I can still see her health bar here. But whenever she spawns all the clones of herself, your job is to find whichever one doesn't have a hat on. And having all of that stuff above her head makes it so much harder. You see here, I mean, it was, I mean, yeah, it's easier because it's a, a normal dungeon. But it's so much easier to find the right one faster so that you just don't risk dying. So just press V on this boss and it makes it so, so easy, I'm telling you. Also, as a melee, whenever you have all these traps spawning, it's your job to pick one of the close ones, but... Think about your tank. Trust me, you'll see a lot more success if you concede the first, the closest ones to your tank. Hell, even going to the far ones is better than going to the first one right next to the boss. Like if I were to run all the way out here, stand here, spawn my little clone, and then run here and make the clone run into that one, that is so much better. You, Your downtime is much uh, less important than a DPS or the tank's downtime. But once again, press V. Try to think about your tank and your DPS whenever you are spawning your little your little clone and watch out for frontals. This boss is really easy, but as a Mistweaver, you can make it a lot easier by doing these things. Also, after you kill the time lost battlefield, you know these pats, these pendules that just go here, and a lot of times you're stuck here just waiting on them to pass so that you can skip these guys. Well, as a Mistweaver, you do have a cool trick where you can par paralyze one of them and it'll halt that entire pack of three so you see here i've paralyzed one and this group of three is stuck there so now well i killed one pack but now there would just be two packs that you just have to wait until they are stopped on either side and you can pass through and it does not aggro them bringing them into combat or anything they are just paralyzed and we can move on through and skip those guys easily now as we wrap up in dawn of the infinite we come up to probably some people would think this is the hardest pool in all of either Dawn of the Infinite dungeons, I honestly would probably agree because this is such a healing check. But with this tip, it should get a little bit easier, a little bit less risky. Now on a lot of pools, I always tell you guys to stagger your cooldowns. So like use Chigi and then wait a bit till people fall a bit lower. Try to space them out and then use Shailun's Gift. But on this fight, this fight in particular, do not be afraid to use your cooldowns back to back or close together at least because the hardest part of this fight is the start when all three are alive and then soon after these two guys will die, something will die, and then you'll just be left with less enemies. The hardest part is at the start. That's when the most damage is coming in. So how I like to pull this pack is since it's a three target cleave scenario, I always Chigi on pool immediately right once you pull this boss or this boss right once you pull this pack i chigi because that's when you're getting the most value from chigi because it's three target cleave but that's also when the most damage is coming out so you want to line those two events up so right on pool i will go ahead and summon chigi and then that allows me to hold on to uh shaylin's gift a bit longer it gives me a little bit time to to ramp up before this infinite fury and all these damage events come out um, and then once this phase is over, usually my Chigi is over by now. But yeah, it lets you carry all of those stacked damage events right on pool, all with one cooldown. And then during that little phase where those, those lines come out, then you can Shailun's Gift normally, or you can Shailun's Gift this next Infinite Fury if you're able to hold on to it. But once again, 
Use your cooldowns on pool, specifically use Chi-Gi on pool if it's available, and then don't be afraid to stack two cooldowns on top of each other, because once these guys die, this pool gets infinitely, infinitely easier. Haha, <laughs> play on words, infinitely easier. And with that being said, don't be afraid to both use your Iridol and Touch of Death to kill one of these Marauders first, like the first one that's starting to fall low. Don't be afraid to just go ahead and execute it to infinitely reduce the damage that your group is taking from this group. It's even to the point where on this pool, I set my target as the lowest health of the two Marauders just to do everything I can to reduce this three pool down to a two pool to make it a little bit easier quicker. Now, the final bit of advice in Dawn of the Infinite is gonna be for Chrono Lord Deus. I'm not gonna talk about how to do the mechanics or anything, but what I will say is a little word of advice for us Mistweavers. So us Mistweavers, we are very used to being super mobile and just being able to roll all over the place, dodge swirlies like that. But on this fight, this is a rare instance where you do not want to. You want to try your hardest to not get baited into rolling out of swirlies. Not these swirlies, but when he goes, when Deus goes into his intermission phase where he goes up into the sky and he just starts raining down all of these swirlies, try your hardest not to roll out of them because you're going to bait them where you're standing. And if you just naturally run or even press Tiger's Lust and run and dodge all the swirlies and they'll be falling right where you were just standing, that is fine. You will not get hit by them. But if you roll, you risk creating just a big crap load of swirlies right between you and where you just were. And you can really cut off your DPS or just ruin their day and get them killed. And a lot of times, like I go back and I watch my old Mirazon's Rise Keys and they are ugly because of this. I was rolling all over the place, and yeah, it was bad. I was getting my DPS killed left and right. So once again, when he goes up in the sky and starts raining down all of those swirlies, do not roll. Just try to run naturally. Try your hardest not to be tempted into rolling. So let me show you what I mean. It's this phase right here. I call it bullet hell. But once again, you're baiting the swirlies where you just were. So you can naturally run out of them. You don't need to roll. So if you roll, you will create a massive nuisance for your DPS or anyone in your group that's around you. Not to mention those swirlies do turn into sand. So if you roll, you're covering more ground, thus literally covering more ground with sand. So once again, I can only say it enough, try not to roll. The final dungeon on today's list is Everbloom, and it starts with this first pool, actually. I've talked about this in my Time Year 20 series, but I'm sure you're used to pulling these guys into this pool over here. But this guy keeps casting, he will stay behind. So what I like to do as the Mistweaver, since I do less damage than the DPS, I don't need to necessarily get into this pool quicker. I like to stand behind, oh, I just killed him. But I like to stand behind and walk with this guy and taxi him. What I mean by that is when he casts, I kick him. And then I start walking and then I'll stop about like right here, start his cast again, I'll ring of peace him a bit closer. And then yeah, then by that point he is stacked with the group. But I like to taxi him, be the carry to kind of like help him, guide him over to this pool by kicking him, by ring of peace, booping him a little bit closer. Now, once again, ring of peace has a lot of utility in these packs though, because these stingers like to pick someone to jump to. So let's do a little role play here. Let's pretend like this ox statue is the tank, is gonna be us, like ourselves, as the Mistweaver or any melee DPS. So that is melee. And let's pretend like me, I am a shadow priest or a mage. These guys are gonna be jumping out to the range and applying a debuff to them. It's gonna be pretty nasty. So what we can do as Mistweavers is we can ring of peace on our teammates and it'll boop these stingers off and prevent them from jumping to them. So that is a trick that I like to use and it also works pretty well with these berserkers. You know, these berserkers are the guys that like to jump to you and they will choose a person to spin on. So they'll jump to someone and spin to them. Let's see if they jump to me and they'll spin on them. You can do the same thing. So like on bolstering weeks, this is a great tip to prevent a lot of damage. All right, once again, to show you, pretend like I'm a mage. 
Boom, I put this there, it boops the, the flea, the little the little dude off, and then the berserker, come on, jump to me. Oh, he didn't do it in time. But yeah, you can put it at their feet, and when they try to jump out, they'll jump and then get booped. It's like you have a protective dome around them. It's really cool and can save a ton of damage, save one shots even on your DPS. Now the next tip is huge in this dungeon, and it has to do with these dread petals. Now, I'm not going to tell you that these guys burst or bolster things around them because I'm sure you figured that out by now. But these guys actually can leave a nasty debuff on whoever they're meleeing. So in most cases, almost all cases, your tank. Now, unfortunately, to show you guys in this video, I'm in a normal mythic dungeon, uh, not a mythic plus dungeon. So they don't actually have the debuff in what I'm showing you. But the debuff is here. Dread Petal Pollen. So successful melee attacks have a chance to coat the target in a sticky pollen, reducing their movement speed and increasing damage taken. So if your tank gets a bunch of stacks of these, I think they can go up to 60%. Then they're moving slow between pools, but they're taking a lot more damage. And that's probably why you're losing your tank on these pools. So on any pools that you have a Dread Petal present, or on a lot of these pools, you'll have multiple, like here they are, there and troves over here, then you need to, as the Mistweaver, Tiger's Lust your tank. It'll remove that slow debuff. It'll remove the pollen from them, thus removing that damage amplification. So anytime that you have a Dread Petal pool, always be Tiger's Lusting on cooldown your tank. This is especially useful, not just on these pools at the start of the dungeon, but if you know on the first boss, a lot of people or a lot of tanks like to pull those, those other two packs of Dread Petals into the first boss because he takes forever, then especially then you don't want your tank to die on that boss because that boss already takes ages. So yeah, if you're ever pulling Dread Petals on any Dread Petal pool, Tiger's Lust, your tank, so they are immune or they lose that slowing debuff that also will make them lose the damage uh, amplification that they're taking. This pool right here. So if my tank ever pulls all these dread petals, if he's fighting them as he's running into the room, like he's like turn around meleeing them right here, all tigers lost him so he can quickly get over here and not be slowed so he can pull the boss, like go ahead and pull this stupid boss. If not, if he just runs and tucks around this corner as they like slowly crawl here, then I'll wait until we get into combat till he pulls the boss, then I'll Tiger's Lust him. So he loses all those debuffs right once these Dread Petals are starting to die. Now, one of the biggest damage events in this entire dungeon is from these Abominations, the Noxious Eruptions. I'm sure you guys have wiped or lost a few people to these Noxious Eruption casts. However, as a Mistweaver, we do have a tool that is that pairs up with it extremely well. What I like to do on these pools, whenever there is a guy that casts Noxious Eruption or an Abomination, I always match that cast with the Shaloon's cast. So once his cast gets about halfway done, I start channeling a Shaloon's gift, and right once that big slam hits, a big heal counters it, and it makes it super easy. But I see a lot of people try to power through it with Vivifies or chi it, but really chi is not the, the cooldown that I think is best versus this incoming damage instance. The next three bosses are pretty major HPS throughput checks. Now, this boss in particular, you do have to kind of coordinate kicks. So who's gonna stop whose casts and whatnot. Now, my tip for this, uh, this boss fight is as a melee healer who does more healing with the more targets you have to hit, your blackout kicks are gonna cleave better onto two targets than it would if you just hit one target. So if you are the person who everyone's like, okay, Who's going to kick Gola and you say, I will, I volunteer as tribute. Still, you want to stack with Telu and Dulu because those are who everyone stacks first. Stack here so that you're cleaving on a two targets, hitting more enemies, thus healing more allies with your ancient teachings in the monastery. And then once you see that revitalized cast go off, roll over there, kick it, stand over there for the tank bait, and then run back and get right back to it. Because like I said, this is a throughput check your healing will matter. And if you're only standing here cleaving off this one target or hitting this one target, as opposed to cleaving off two, you're gonna do a lot less healing. Also, you're gonna be nerfing your Chiji. Your Chiji, those mastery procs will add up. So if you're, if you're hitting two targets with all of those blackout kicks, you're getting so much more mastery proc healing. So yeah, like I said, always make sure you're stacked on the biggest stack of tanks, unless you do have to move out for a mechanic, obviously. 
but try to keep your two target uptime as high as possible and you'll see this fight gets a lot easier. I used to just stand over here by Gola and I would just sit here and stare at him punching and kicking him all day wondering why am I falling behind on the healing required and it's because I'm just hitting one target. You want to be stacked on the two targets over here. Next up is Arc Mage Soul. Now this is the noob killer boss I know because this is just such a big learning curve of a boss because the mechanics are weird. They're a little hard to understand at first, but let me simplify how we handle it as a Mistweaver. So as you know, she has a small cast and then she'll do a big cast. Then she'll do a small cast and a big cast. And those big casts alternate between her three elements. So void, fire, ice. She starts out just casting a fire spell. So cinder bolt, salvo. That is what does the big damage. The other ones are just mechanics to muddle the mixture, make you have to think a little bit harder, and that, that usually is what causes the wipes or the deaths, is you're thinking about the movement of the other two, the ice and the void one, and you die to the damage of the fire. But as a Mistweaver, you always, always, always want to come into this fight either popping Chi-Chi right once you pull her, or having a fully stacked Shaloons or Revival ready to go, because she is going to cast her fire big cast on pool. So right once we pull her, hopefully the, the mythic, traditional mythic version does it. Uh, well, this is boring. Okay, yeah, Cinderbolt Salvo right once you, you pull her, basically. So you're going to want to either have Shailene's ready to go or have just Chi-Chi rolling for that right once you pull her. And then next up, she'll do a small cast. You don't have to use any cooldowns for that. So Fireball, boom, it happened. And then she'll do another big cast. This time, it'll be Fire and Ice. So she'll do her fire cast and then she'll spawn these ice rings around everyone. So you'll also want your cooldowns for that. The good thing about this though, is you don't need a major cooldown for all the big casts. So once she, she does her small cast again, next up is gonna be ice and void. This one you do not need a throughput cooldown for. It is purely a movement thing. It, it does not require a, a healing cooldown. So save your Chi-Chi. So you use your Chi-Chi on the first one, you use your Shaloons on the second Cinderbolt Salvo, and now it's gonna come back again. You have Chi-Chi ready to go, small cast. Next up is a big cast. It's gonna be Arcane and Fire, I think. Now we Chi-Chi, we're rolling through it. We're healing through all this damage. As long as we don't get yoinked into fire, we healed through all that damage, we're good to go. Now, there are some more tips that I wanna show you guys. These totems are excellent on the void rounds, the big void orb that pulls you in, they're excellent to allow you to stay in melee, which is very important on the specifically the void and fire round when she does her void cast and the fire cast because she'll try to suck you out of melee, but you can use these totems, you can stand by a totem to kind of stay in melee and kind of not get yoinked out. So let me show you, hopefully I can show you on this one. So we're gonna try to bait the void over here and you can stand on this void to, or on this totem, and I didn't even get pulled that way because the totem, oh my gosh, I'm stuck in it. But the totem like body blocks you. You can stand with the void here, stand here, you'll stay here, and you'll likely the boss can be pulled like right here. And if if your mage is standing out here baiting, you can stand right next to this totem and get pulled barely, and you'll be totally fine. Stay in melee, um, and it can help your throughput. Now, coming up on Yalnu, he is a sneaky hard boss. I'm sure in earlier key levels, you probably did not have any trouble with him, but now that you're in the higher key levels, he hurts. Colossal Blow does big damage, but do not, even if you come into this pool with Chi-Chi, try your hardest not to use Chi-Chi. Try to commit Shaloons to Colossal Blow because one, it just like with Noxious, Noxious Eruption, it pairs up very well, but two, just like on the Trio boss, how you want to be optimizing your, your Chi-Chi cooldown, try to save Chi-Chi for when the Ancient is out, and then he overlaps the Colossal Blow with that Ancient damage. This Ancient, this add, does a ton of damage to your group, so having Chi-Chi out while he is out, it'll allow you to cover the biggest amount of incoming damage. Also, it'll allow you to optimize your Chi-Chi because once again, you're going to be hitting multiple targets with Chi-Chi out, having, oh my God, having more mastery procs, and it'll just make this fight a lot easier 
if you line up your cooldowns that way because imagine a world where you don't line up your chi with this ancient or while this ancient's out you just chi on pool get those first two colossal blows done that'll seem easier but by the time that this ancient is out if you only have shaylun's gift to deal with it you're gonna fall behind it'll do a lot less um, than you you would hope it'll do a lot less than chi would in that instance so once again save chi for when the Ancient is out because you'll get more value from it and it'll make it a lot easier. And this dungeon should fall over a little bit easier if you try to incorporate some of these tips into your next run. Let me know how they go. Uh, these dungeons are some of the hardest ones of this rotation. So that is why I'm starting with them in this series. Um, but guys, stay tuned for episode three where we finally cover the last two dungeons, Waycrest and Black Hold. But my name is Elvin Ninja 7 your resident Miss Weaver Monk. I love making this style video. You guys know if you come and talk to me during my streams, you know I love helping and tutoring and teaching. It's a passion of mine. So videos like this are videos that I enjoy making. So look forward to the other two. And if you have any tips or tricks that Miss Weavers have at our disposal that I might have missed, leave those down in the comments below and go check the comments. You guys left awesome tips in the last episode. So once again, check out the comments and see if there are any good ones for you that I might have missed. But before we end this video, I have to give a special shout out to the patrons of this channel because if it weren't for them, I would literally not still be here. I would have been forced to quit my dream of being a YouTuber. So thank you so much to these guys for allowing me to still be here and to make videos like this one. So huge shout out to them. And if you wanna join this list of names, make sure and check out the link down in the description below to my Patreon. And while you're down there, do all the other sellout stuff. Like I said, comment, subscribe, like the video, all that sellout stuff. Thank you so much, guys. I'll see you in the next video. Hopefully this video helped you guys. But until then, take care.